Good afternoon friends, as you are aware this week we have organized series of lecture on rise of Magadha and Mauryan Empire. Yesterday we discussed the different factors which uh, finally helped uh, in the rise of Magadha and what are the policy taken by the ruler and what were the odds uh, the all ruler faced and despite the challenges finally succeeded in establishing a big empire. So we will continue our discussion and we will move up to the Aurian, Mauryan period and we will our main focus would be to know the sources of uh, history of Mauryan periods and we will also try to understand in different perspective what happened during those period and uh, what were the forces which were uh, not in favorable of the uh, Magadh empire uh, still uh, uh, the ruler of the time they took the decision and took the steps which finally turned out to be in his favor. What we call that uh, physical uh, location was good in, uh, and in favor of the Magadh but uh, apart from this there are other forces that was not favorable but uh, uh, in due to the foresight of the uh, ruler uh, it helped. So I will try to understand in different uh, uh, perspectives and will come to know the different dimensions and for discussion on this very topic we have in the studio Professor Sankar Kumar. He is presently assistant professor in, in department of history at Hindu college and his area of uh, uh, interest is uh, ancient India. So I hope his knowledge and experience will help us to understand this topic and will also give a new insight. So on your behalf I welcome him for the uh, Edusat lecture on this topic. Welcome sir. Thank you Amarindra ji. Uh, and uh, good afternoon viewers. Uh, I suppose uh, yesterday's discussion was about the rise of uh, Magadh uh, as a region in history uh, around the middle of the first millennium BC. Uh, this particular period uh, is uh, extremely important in the sense that uh, the entire stretch of the Gangetic Plains uh, got, uh, uh, you can say, inhabited uh, under, uh, you can say, uh, intensive cultivation. Uh, of course, there were uh, several other modes of uh, uh, subsistence which uh, coexisted. Nevertheless, the main stream, the, the, uh, the main stay of the economy uh, around this time, around 6th century BC uh, became agriculture. Now in this context, if we look at the political uh, angle of uh, these changes around the first millennium BC, uh, you have already uh, studied the rise of Magad in yesterday's uh, discussion in uh, a reasonable detailed way. So I shall not be uh, dwelling on that. But what we shall try to do today uh, in our discussion is, uh, is, to, is to trace uh, the processes which actually were the ongoing processes in the period between 6th century BC and till around the beginning of the Mauryan period that is around the 4th century AD, uh, so sorry 4th century BC. Now if we, if we trace uh, uh, this period. Uh, what we find is uh, in uh, political terms and uh, that is where uh, we should be, uh, we should be uh, beginning our discussion because uh, the immediate precedent is uh, the uh, Mauryan, uh, sorry the uh, Magadh uh, area which had become important uh, around 6th century BC. So in, in terms of uh, political changes what we find is that post 6th century BC, the triumphant march of uh, territorial states and monarchical system uh, continued. This was uh, at the expense of, uh, we can say, the uh, other forms of polities uh, which were semi-republican kinds, which were uh, tribal forms of uh, polities and so forth. So, overall what we find is that the monarchical form of polity uh, 
triumphed over other forms of polities which had coexisted uh, around this time. But as we move further in history, we find monarchical uh, territorial states uh, sort of encompassing the entire region, the entire North uh, Indian stretch. Uh, this is not to say that other uh, forms of polities uh, uh, vanished altogether. They did survive, particularly in the northwestern part of India, even in the postmodern period, uh, they continued to survive as uh, tribal chieftainships and so forth. But the main form of political organization, of course, during this period was monarchical uh, territorial uh, form of polity. Now, in this context, if we see the 4th century BC or the time around uh, 325 uh, BC, which, which is uh, regarded as the time around which the uh, Mauryans came to power, what we find is that the roots of territorial states got further strengthened. When we say roots of territorial states getting further strengthened, what we mean here is, is, is its, its uh, uh, premises, the, the uh, conditions over which such territorial states emerged, that had uh, become, become more strengthened. The revenue uh, sources the social stratification, the gap between uh, the uh, ruling class and the ruled, uh, that got uh, further uh, extended, uh, meaning thereby that the social stratification also uh, was an ongoing process uh, facilitating uh, the, the emergence of the ruling class or, or crystallization of the ruling class uh, becoming more prominent around this time. So, uh, by the time we reach the uh, emergence of the Mauryas, which we shall be talking about subsequently, what we should keep in mind and that is the format of our today's uh, discussion, that in political terms, it is the territorial states and monarchical form of polity which has become the dominant political organization, political uh, form of, uh, of uh, governance uh, post 6th century BC in North India. Uh, now, let us let's try to uh, look at the social angle of, of this change in terms of process. The stratification that we have been talking of, the social stratification that ha we have been talking of can be studied with reference to the proliferation of uh, new uh, social groups which were theoretically aligned in the fourfold world divisions and uh, we find the Brahman, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, uh, the fourfold world division getting all the more uh, uh, solidified. So, uh, what earlier existed uh, as, as a mere uh, division of labor kind of an arrangement uh, now had come to acquire uh, other traits with which we tend to understand uh, Varna system or uh, Jati system uh, even uh, in the subsequent times. For example, the endogamous element, the uh, hierarchical element, the division of labor was already there. So, uh, the, the uh, caste becoming uh, uh, hereditary in nature. So, these, these traits uh, got added to it uh, which, uh, which, which further got consolidated and uh, that is how uh, the new occupations uh, resulting from intensification of agriculture and also proliferation of uh, trade and commercial and artisanal activities which had been an ongoing process ever since 6th century BC. So, all these social groups which were emerging uh, during this period, they were sought to be aligned along the fourfold Werner division which was the Brahmanical uh, uh, way of, of uh, uh, stratifying people with an implicit sense of uh, purity, hierarchy and so forth. 
it is extremely important for us to understand that uh, the position of women uh, since agriculture is getting intensified uh, is also undergoing uh, some kind of a change. We have uh, uh, particularly with reference to the post Mauryan period, we have some kind of conflicting uh, 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 views about the position of women with reference to Sri Dhan and also with reference to the subservience or total dependence on men. Uh, coming from even Brahmanical sources, but at the same time uh, we find that uh, particularly in the post Mauryan period uh, with reference to the emergence of the Satvahans and so forth, uh, the, uh, the position of women is, is not uh, uh, or in fact it should not be unilinearly uh, understood because uh, there is fair degree of uh, semblance of power being exercised because uh, quite a few uh, Satvahan rulers are using uh, maternal names, names of their mothers in order to identify themselves, uh, be it the case of uh, Gautami Putra Shatkarni or other uh, Satvahan kings. So, uh, it is not as if uh, there is the picture of total subservience of uh, women on men. Nevertheless, uh, uh, the, the kind of autonomy uh, and access to uh, religious uh, uh, rituals and so forth, which uh, the women uh, uh, are supposed to have been enjoying during the Rigvedic period, had undergone a uh, perceptible change by this time. And uh, there is, uh, uh, you can say, decline in the position of uh, women so far as uh, wielding uh, such powers or having access to such avenues of leveraging power uh, are concerned. So, uh, that takes care of the, the, uh, uh, the uh, social scenario. Nevertheless, we should keep in mind that this Brahmanical uh, projection of the social scenario uh, around this time is, is countered by another set of uh, uh, sources, literary sources, uh, which are coming from the Jain and, uh, relig uh, Jain and Buddhist uh, uh, religious sources. Uh, now, uh, given the outlook of the uh, uh, Buddhism and Jainism and several other, uh, uh, you can say, heterodox sects, uh, which, were, which were not orthodox, which were uh, kind of opposing the uh, heavy entrenchment of Brahmanical ethos and norms and practices in society, uh, they also uh, make themselves uh, very much visible uh, during this period. So, the kind of picture that we get from the Dharma Sutras uh, and, and uh, other Brahmanical sources uh, are, uh, are also uh, seen in a, in a somewhat different way. Uh, which, which suggests that this kind of dominance, uh, this kind of uh, uh, emergence of the Kshatriyas and the uh, Brahmins uh, as the ruling class, which was exemplified through the emergence of the monarchical system, territorial states and so forth, is getting uh, challenged. Uh, so much so, uh, that uh, the first empire which emerged in the form of the Mauryans uh, actually uh, through its uh, emperors, through its kings uh, who, who were, who were, uh, uh, were non-Kshatriyas probably. So, uh, again there are conflicting views related to the, uh, the uh, social uh, uh, identity of the Mauryan kings. Uh, nevertheless, what is, uh, what is, uh, what is uh, uh, extremely uh, uh, true is that uh, Chandragupta Maurya uh, became a Jain, uh, particularly uh, around the time uh, he, uh, he uh, renounced uh, the world and uh, became a wanderer and uh, similarly uh, Bindusar, uh, the son of uh, Chandragupta. Uh, showed uh, proximity uh, with the Ajivikas. Uh, 
similarly, Ashok, uh, the next uh, king uh, from the Mauryas, uh, was a Buddhist. And uh, therefore, what we find is that the uh, idealized notion of the uh, Varn Vivastha, which, uh, which enjoined upon uh, the Kshatriyas to become uh, or, or uh, which uh, made this kind of an arrangement that only Kshatriyas could be the kings, uh, in reality, we are seeing a different picture altogether. And uh, uh, this way, uh, uh, you know, the, the credibility of non Brahmanical sources, particularly uh, Buddhist Jataka stories and other uh, Jain sources, uh, becomes uh, more strengthened because uh, they have been talking uh, in terms of uh, some kind of an anti Brahmanical uh, tenor. So, uh, this kind of uh, hierarchy, uh, this kind of uh, superiority of Brahmins uh, over the Kshatriyas and Kshatriyas over uh, the other uh, Varnas, that is contested in these uh, sources. Uh, if we uh, look across the Pali literature or uh, the Buddhist literature or Jain literature, we find that there is a fair sense of uh, approval and uh, some kind of uh, some kind of uh, getting along with the uh, with the vaishyas uh, and and this has to be understood uh, also in the context that uh, the merchants the traders the artisans the agriculturalists who are all clubbed under the uh, vaishyas they are uh, economically prospering uh, in this period uh, we have uh, uh, reference to uh, big traders, big um, uh, merchants making huge donations uh, to the cause of Buddhism uh, and even otherwise uh, their scale of operation seems to be uh, very big in monetary terms. So, uh, obviously, the sense of unease uh, with their social status, the sense of unease with respect to their economic and social, uh, uh, you can say, uh, unsynchronization, uh, that is supposed to be latched on to uh, by, by these uh, uh, upcoming religions, uh, Buddhism and Jainism. And, uh, uh, the Jatak stories also uh, reveal uh, some kind of uh, a sense of ridicule or, or uh, uh, the sense that uh, the lower orders are also of uh, equal importance uh, and there is no such implicit, uh, implicit sense of superiority vested with uh, the uh, Brahmins and so forth. So, uh, this is about the uh, social scenario. Uh, around this time, uh, that is from 6th century uh, BC to uh, the time when uh, Mauryans uh, emerged as uh, imperial power. Now, talking of the economic uh, changes, uh, we can uh, discuss it with reference to agriculture, trade and craft, which we indicated. Uh, in agrarian terms, uh, during the Mauryan period, uh, we are informed of uh, huge uh, state managed uh, uh, farms, uh, which are worked upon by uh, huge number of uh, agri uh, agricultural labor uh, and so forth that has uh, induced some historians to even, uh, even uh, uh, think of the Mauryan economy as a extremely centralized kind of an economy. Of course, that was not the case. But what is true nevertheless is that the agrarian base uh, of uh, these uh, territorial empires or these territorial states uh, had become more uh, stable, had become more consolidated by around the Mauryan period. Uh, this was uh, as a result of uh, uh, the entire uh, middle Gangetic plains uh, having been brought under uh, the vortex of agriculture. Uh, forests uh, probably were cleared, uh, historians debate about the extent to which forests were cleared. Uh, agricultural implements, uh, 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 new agricultural implements uh, were used. Uh, 
this is testified uh, not only by archaeology but also by uh, literary sources. Uh, use of iron has been extensively debated amongst historians uh, as having played some kind of uh, a revolutionary role in this. But what we should also understand is the crucial role played by uh, new agricultural techniques like uh, transplantation of uh, paddy or you can say uh, rice. Uh, because this technique seems to have emerged uh, uh, post 6th century BC which, uh, uh, which led to a uh, huge increase uh, in, the, in the agricultural productivity which could sustain more number of people uh, which could, uh, uh, which could uh, generate uh, more material surplus for the state to siphon off and elaborate uh, the uh, administrative apparatus which was very, uh, very crucial for the survival of, uh, of these uh, uh, territorial states which uh, by the time uh, of 4th century uh, BC uh, had also assumed imperial dimension in the form of the Mauryas. So, in terms of political process, uh, what uh, we as uh, uh, practitioners of history should understand is that uh, politically, uh, the processes which started in 6th century BC uh, in the sense of emergence of territorial states uh, are getting intensified, elaborated to the extent that by the time we reach 4th century BC, uh, it has assumed some kind of an imperial proportions. Other areas have also been brought under uh, the, the political uh, management of the uh, Mauryans, which, dis, uh, which uh, was uh, distinctly a territorial uh, empire uh, and it had monarchical form of governance. Uh, so, uh, what we find that uh, even in the regions which are south of the Vindhyas uh, and down south, the peninsular India, uh, some kind of, we can say, uh, diffusion of uh, these ideas, these political, social uh, and economic uh, techniques uh, are somehow permeating uh, in these regions outside the uh, North Indian uh, Gangetic Plain area. So, uh, I mean, it is uh, some some historian has has uh, uh, has uh, used uh, these uh, three M's uh, as the vehicles on which these ideas got carried. Uh, for example, monks, merchants, and monarchs, who were the uh, you can say harbingers of uh, these ideas uh, from uh, North India to areas uh, which are emerging, uh, to regions which are emerging uh, in the Deccan as well as uh, South India. This is not to say that merely uh, these ideas were enough because uh, for these ideas uh, to have actually played a role in bringing about some kind of socio-economic transformation in these areas, it was extremely important that these areas themselves had enough capacity uh, uh, within themselves to generate uh, enough surplus to have that kind of uh, social uh, organization which could, uh, which could uh, uh, actually uh, uh, suck these ideas and uh, it could have led to transformation uh, of these uh, regions in uh, territorial states or uh, uh, monarchical polities and so forth. But that was to happen subsequently. So far as this period is concerned, the urban centers uh, which were, uh, which were uh, distinctly present only in the northern part of India and the northwestern part of India in the intervening period that is uh, from the period uh, of uh, rise of Magadh up to uh, the, the Mauryan period, we find that these urban centers are also starting to emerge uh, in the Deccan area. Uh, we have the example of Tripuri, Ujjaini, uh, Vidisha and so forth and uh, that, that tells us that uh, 
the practice of agriculture, trade, commerce, uh, etc., had uh, had uh, begun in these areas also uh, in a in a significant way, and. Uh, uh, down south, if we, if we see, uh, there are uh, quite a few examples of uh, megalithic cultures, uh, which uh, which uh, which are understood in the in the context of uh, economy as uh, as a, a mixture of pastoral and uh, agricultural mode of existence. Uh, they are using iron uh, implements. They are also using uh, horse. There is a profusion of uh, uh, war-like uh, or, or uh, implements uh, related to uh, wars. So uh, it, it gives uh, this kind of an uh, uh, this kind of a picture that uh, there are quite a few varying groups, uh, and uh, they are uh, trying to establish their supremacy in their own areas, and they are fighting it out amongst uh, the neighboring uh, communities and so forth, uh, which, which uh, can be understood with reference to increased social stratification and so forth. Down south, for example, uh, we have the uh, beginning of the Sangam period around this time, 3rd century uh, BC onwards. Uh, which which gives us uh, a picture of uh, tribal chieftainships uh, and uh, the polity uh, being organized uh, on ecological tinnies, uh, which are eco zones, and uh, uh, increasingly the importance of uh, fertile land, agriculturally fertile land, is being felt, and uh, more and more uh, kings. Uh, are are uh, trying to uh, bring more and more uh, marutam areas uh, as they were called in sangam literature uh, the areas which huge potential of uh, agricultural production so forth the green areas uh, so th they were trying to have access to uh, the resources agricultural resources which which combined with uh, with the uh, uh, with the uh, prospects or economic prospects of the ongoing uh, indo roman trade with which the peninsular india was associated uh, to to lead to some kind of the potential for transforming their polities uh, to to the higher level of uh, territoriality uh, beyond the kinship uh, based uh, uh, rules to to territory based rules the uh, the kind of process that 6th uh, uh, century bc had seen in uh, north india so uh, such kind of process uh, 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 probably uh, is about to be replicated uh, subsequently uh, down south on account of factors that we just talked of so uh, in terms of processes these are uh, these are the uh, key historical processes that we as a students of history should be mindful of and uh, these tendencies are are increasingly uh, affecting areas uh, which uh, which are uh, south of vindhyas as well and we have already discussed the uh, agencies through which uh, such changes were uh, were uh, brought about now in terms of religion as we can see uh, on the slide uh, we have referred to the heterodox religions uh, we have already alluded to the presence of uh, non brahmanical uh, religions uh, which had uh, come into existence uh, in the form of social movement around 6th century BC only. But uh, by the time we come to the modern period and the post-modern period, we find that even uh, these religions had started uh, developing uh, cracks or fissions uh, and uh, several, uh, several uh, separate uh, sects had uh, come to emerge from within uh, Buddhism and Jainism. All of us know about the Hinians, Mahayans uh, with reference to Buddhism. Similarly, uh, Swetambars and the Digambars uh, with reference to uh, Jainism. Uh, 
So uh, they are to be understood with reference to uh, the contrasting uh, uh, ways of uh, worshipping and uh, presumptions about God. Uh, practices the new uh, uh, the new practices which had uh, which had come to impact uh, these religions for example the donations which were made uh, the form uh, in which uh, uh, buddha was to be uh, worshipped uh, and and so forth the the ways and means by which one could acquire uh, uh, merit punya uh, by resorting to uh, different uh, uh, religious activities and so forth. So, uh, what, what we are trying to say here is that uh, these uh, tendencies had been impacting not only Brahmanism, but also other uh, heterodox religions which had made their appearance from 6th century BC onwards. And uh, as we move uh, towards the modern period, this is how things are uh, things are uh, getting to be seen now this brings us uh, to the discussion uh, related to the uh, sources by which we tend to reconstruct the mauryan history now uh, the uh, mauryan history uh, is premised on a set of sources which are qualitatively and quantitatively uh, you can say superior to the earlier period. This is because uh, uh, the range of literary sources that we encounter during the Mauryan period, the range of archaeological sources. Uh, that we encounter uh, during the Mauryan period is uh, quantitatively more than the earlier periods. Uh, inscriptions, for, uh, for instance, uh, uh, make their appearance for the first time uh, in Indian history, if we keep aside the Harappan case, because uh, inscriptions uh, are not deciphered in the Harappan case. Therefore, inscriptions are making its beginning as a source of historical reconstruction in the form of uh, Ashokan uh, edicts and inscriptions and so forth. The uh, material culture uh, identified with the chronological layer of the Mauryas uh, in the uh, Gangetic Basin is, uh, is identified as NBPW, uh, that is uh, something that you can see in abbreviation in your slide, that stands for Northern Black Polished Wares. Uh, we will talk about it in detail subsequently. Uh, alongside, we also have coins, uh, the typical punch marked coins. Uh, which were usually made of silver uh, and carrying different motives. This is important because uh, despite the Mauryans being an imperial power, it is still, uh, it is still uh, believed that uh, they were not issuing uh, coins from a central place and probably the agencies or sources issuing these coins uh, uh, were uh, more decentralized uh, in the form of guilds, different trade and artisanal guilds rather than the state. Because subsequent to the modern times, it becomes the, uh, it becomes the sole prerogative of the state uh, and uh, uh, coin making, minting coins uh, becomes a symbol of uh, sovereignty. And yet, uh, up to the Mauryan period, this is not quite the case. But this is not to say that uh, coins uh, which facilitated uh, uh, interactions, which facilitated exchange, which facilitated uh, trade and commercial uh, uh, activities uh, were not to be seen during the Mauryan period because we have quite a few number of punch mark coins belonging to the Mauryan period. Now, uh, given uh, this richness of the sources, uh, for reconstruction of the Mauryan period, uh, our understanding of the uh, Mauryan history is uh, more uh, stable and uh, the contours of the Mauryan uh, polity, Mauryan empire and the Mauryan economy 
is more clearly drawn as compared to the earlier periods. Uh, with reference to uh, uh, the sources uh, informing us about the kings uh, and the rule and the uh, maybe the period of the Mauryan rule and so forth. For example, we have quite a few Puranas which obviously uh, were written as a source subsequent to the Mauryan times. They inform us uh, that there were uh, 13 Mauryan kings who ruled for 137 years. Other Puranas talk of only 9 kings and so forth. But with the uh, inscriptions uh, and other uh, accounts uh, including the uh, foreign accounts, uh, we can work it out uh, in a better way. The chronological uh, skeleton of the modern period has been worked out uh, more uh, satisfactorily as compared to the other earlier period. It is now uh, believed that uh, modern period extended from 324 BCE to 187 BCE and uh, even the succession of kings uh, can be worked out with a fair degree of satisfaction uh, so far as the Mauryans are concerned. We also have uh, subsequently written uh, literary pieces, uh, uh, for example, the Mudra Rakshas by Vishakhdat, which was written around uh, 5th century uh, in the common era. Uh, they, they use the Mauryan uh, context. For example, it, it, uh, it informs us about the, uh, about the maneuverings and uh, the, the, uh, the stories that we generally know about Chanakya at the popular level, uh, how he plotted against Rakshas, uh, who was a minister, uh, who was a Nand uh, uh, minister uh, serving under the Nand kings and so forth. So, uh, even uh, the imageries of uh, the modern period uh, have been uh, used by subsequent writers uh, to inform us about uh, the kind of uh, uh, political uh, bickerings or the ways in which uh, uh, Mauryans uh, emerged as a power, as a, as a territorial power, uh, as a power to reckon with, so much so that across two generations it had definitely acquired the uh, dimension of uh, an empire, pan-Indian kind of uh, presence is registered uh, in the case of the Mauryans because uh, if we look at the uh, territorial stretch of the Mauryas, uh, that includes uh, uh, greater part of uh, the present day Indian subcontinent, of course it did exclude the peninsular states, uh, Chol, Cher, Pandya, Satyaputras, etc., are referred to uh, as the neighboring states uh, in one of the Ashokan inscriptions, uh, thereby clearly stating that the areas beyond this, uh, that is areas north to this, uh, certainly was under the Mauryan control. Similarly, uh, in the northwest region, uh, the entire uh, Afghanistan uh, area, including the present day Pakistan, they were all under the, the Mauryan control. Uh, this obviously included the Deccan uh, and uh, the conventional uh, North Indian uh, uh, plains. So, the territorial presence was uh, definitely pan-Indian. Of course, uh, uh, historians uh, in the uh, past couple of decades or more than that, they have been uh, talking about uh, the differences uh, so far as nature of the Mauryan Empire is concerned, to what extent it was centralized, to what extent we should not be viewing it as extremely centralized and bureaucratized kind of an empire. So, uh, that is a, a topic that probably we shall be uh, talking about separately, but uh, here with reference to the sources, uh, Puranas uh, talk about uh, the Mauryas in a particular way. Similarly, we also have uh, uh, the Buddhist and Jain texts, uh, which inform us uh, in their own ways about the uh, Mauryan times. Uh, at times, they also try to, for example, with reference to Ashok, they try to uh, bring him under uh, uh, Buddhist uh, uh, discourse. And uh, that's how they they uh, they celebrate uh, the existence of Ashok uh, as a king, and uh, uh, Jain sources also do tell us a lot about the uh, religious as well as economic uh, conditions and social conditions uh, during uh, this intervening period. 
uh, from uh, the rise of Magadh up to the uh, uh, Mauryan uh, period. Similarly, uh, the uh, Tamil sources, the Sangam literature that we talked of, they have also been studied and uh, attempts have been made to discern uh, from Sangam literature the instance uh, or uh, uh, the, the inklings of some kind of uh, southward uh, uh, expansion of the Mauryan rulers and they do testify to, to uh, this kind of a, uh, this kind of a phenomena. So, uh, this, uh, this array of uh, literary sources uh, inform us uh, about the Mauryan period in a qualitatively different way. Uh, the beauty is that uh, the reliance uh, to, to reconstruct uh, or, or reliance on a particular source in order to reconstruct uh, the history of a particular period uh, is not on a sole source. So, uh, we uh, can corroborate, we can question the assumptions, the elaborations, the articulations of a particular source with a particular bias uh, in history so far as modern period is concerned. So, that can be rectified and that uh, is uh, something that uh, qualitatively changes our understanding about the uh, social and economic scenario of the modern period. So, uh, that is one set of literary sources. Alongside, uh, we also have uh, several foreign accounts. Uh, we all know about uh, Megasthenes who stayed at the uh, modern capital at Patliputra as the ambassador, uh, Greek ambassador. Uh, and he has left his own account in the uh, form of a book which is now lost. Uh, the name of the book is Indica, uh, which, uh, which does not uh, exist. Uh, in its original form. Nevertheless, uh, several uh, uh, Greek and Roman writers of subsequent period have quoted uh, uh, excerpts uh, and instances from Indica, which was written by Megasthenes. Uh, for example, uh, Strabo, Pliny, Diodorus and so forth, they, they do refer to uh, the portions from Indica and uh, it is through these uh, sources that we get to know that uh, Megasthenes had uh, left an account uh, of the modern period which is, uh, uh, which is used as a kind of corrective to uh, the uh, administrative details or uh, uh, other, other details uh, that we get from uh, Indian sources, uh, indigenous sources. Uh, even uh, the inscriptional uh, sources, uh, that is uh, the Ashokan inscriptions, do talk about uh, the organizational uh, uh, means and ways uh, through which his rule was uh, managed. Uh, the officials, the names of the officials and other details, uh, even uh, uh, the uh, Arthashastra, uh, which has its own interesting story. Uh, of uh, being found and understood in the context of the modern period, uh, because it was around 1905 that uh, one manuscript was brought to the notice of R. Uh, Sham Shastri. And uh, over a period of time, he informed uh, uh, the academia and other people about this manuscript, which probably uh, belonged to the uh, modern period. Uh, and uh, 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 around the 1960s, uh, around 1963 or so, uh, R. P. Kangli published uh, the uh, critical edition of uh, Arthashastra, which was written by Cotillia uh, by using different manuscripts which existed. Uh, and uh, then uh, a kind of understanding about the modern period uh, became, uh, became uh, very, very solid. Uh, and uh, this information uh, which comes from Arthashastra is used uh, by uh, historians in order to reconstruct the, uh, the nature of polity, the nature of state under the Mauryas. Uh, in the recent times, uh, the nature of this particular text has also been uh, questioned in the sense that uh, this uh, Arthashastra, uh, which was written by Cotillia, which is identified uh, with uh, Chanakya, uh, 
perhaps uh, was a prescriptive text. So what it gives to us is the ideal notion of a state, of an empire, uh, the ideal type of a king and his duties and the officials, the way it should be governed, not actually the way it was governed. So uh, it is said uh, by uh, these historians that uh, uh, Arthashastra should be understood in the context of the text being a prescriptive text rather than descriptive text. The import here is that we should not take uh, uh, Arthashastric uh, elaborations on its face value. So uh, whatever is uh, uh, whatever is talked about uh, in terms of economy, in terms of officials or in terms of duties and privileges of the king uh, should not actually be understood as if that is the way it actually was. So uh, the, uh, the notion of the Mauryan state as an extremely centralized and bureaucratized kind of an empire actually stems. Uh, act actually begins from this kind of a uh, reading, uncritical reading of Arthashastra. And uh, uh, the pan-Indian uh, presence of the Mauryan administration is also questioned uh, in the recent times by uh, theorizations uh, uh, related to the nature of, uh, uh, nature of you can say, uh, empires uh, in the ancient times where, uh, for example, Romila Thapar has spoken about uh, the uh, differing concerns uh, of the metropolitan state which is located uh, in Patliputra uh, so far as the entire stretch of the territory under its control is concerned. For example, uh, what she says is that the concern of the metropolitan state from the nuclear area which is the area in the vicinity of Patliputra the middle Gangetic plain and so forth uh, would differ from its concern with the core area which, uh, which is identified as the area around or alongside the periphery of the nuclear area uh, which will include the central India and so forth and the peripheral areas. Peripheral areas would include uh, the areas down south uh, around Karnata, Kolar mines and so forth. So uh, the concern uh, from uh, the peripheral areas would only be to uh, maybe uh, organize uh, uh, economic, uh, uh, you can say, uh, resource utilization in some way or the other. Governance, actual governance could not have been uh, the uh, prime concern uh, in these areas. So, uh, that is something uh, which, is, which is over and beyond the sources, but what, uh, why we have been talking about it is because uh, actually such kinds of discussions also emerge from a particular uh, way of reading these sources which became uh, available particularly uh, after the, uh, after the uh, publication of uh, Arthashastra uh, which, was, uh, which was very rich uh, so far as uh, uh, in terms of uh, information uh, pertaining to this particular period. Of course, it is debated, some historians do say that it is a post Mauryan um, description or it is, uh, it refers to post Mauryan scenario uh, rather than uh, the Mauryan period. Nevertheless, uh, the idealized kind of picture that we get does reflect uh, uh, some kind of uh, the visualization that was made around this time uh, for kings, for empires, for ministers, for governance and so forth. Uh, Megasthenes' account, uh, although being a f uh, foreign account, uh, at times uh, misses the point in terms of capturing the social details. Uh, nevertheless, uh, they also testify uh, uh, to some of the elaborations uh, done in administrative terms uh, in Arthashastra uh, in terms of the uh, officials. Of course, the numbers vary, but uh, by and large, they, they synchronize. Uh, the same synchronization can be seen uh, even with reference to the details contained in Ashokan inscriptions. Now, Ashokan inscriptions is important uh, because, uh, of course, there is a range of Ashokan inscriptions. There are uh, major rock edicts, there are uh, pillar edicts, there are minor rock edicts, and they all talk about different themes and issues. 
the policy of dham uh, is best articulated uh, in in these uh, rock inscriptions of ashok the administrative aspect of uh, uh, the mauryan rule is also revealed uh, to quite an extent uh, through uh, the readings of uh, ashokan inscriptions what is important is the uh, alongside the details contained in these inscriptions is also the location of these inscriptions and the intent behind this if we plot on the map of india uh, the distribution of uh, ashokan edicts we will find that uh, they are concentrated more on the nodal points of uh, exchange and interactions uh the areas which are perhaps frequented by monks monarchs and merchants so uh, the areas of what we can understand as relative isolation uh, are the areas where these inscriptions are not to be found and this fits in with the argument of the differing concern of the uh, mauryan state with different areas with uh, different regions in terms of is uh, its uh, in terms of their resource capacity and uh, the prospects uh, of uh, siphoning of uh, the resources so much so that the kaling war uh, which all of us are familiar with uh, which uh, in which uh, ashok emerged as uh, the uh, triumphant king but subsequently uh, was uh, taken by uh, or overwhelmed uh, by remorse a sense of remorse and hence uh, uh, became a buddhist that's how uh, buddhist account uh, uh, buddhist accounts uh, inform us uh, now even uh, this kaling war is understood so far as uh, uh, the economics of uh, the uh, mauryan period goes with reference to what in uh, arthashastra is uh, uh, is explained by the term janapad nivesh uh, now janapad nivesh is is uh, uh, is a policy by which the king or the monarch uh, induces people to inhabit those areas which are uh, uninhabited which are uh, uh, which are not colonized and begin agriculture and other economic activities and to begin with some kinds of concession uh, is granted uh, in the form of absence of uh, taxes and revenue by the state uh, the, uh, the the long term intent uh, behind such policies is that once people settle in those areas over generations uh, they'll start economic activities these economic activity activities will intensify and hence uh, subsequently create conditions uh, for uh, the state to generate revenue out of uh, these economic activities so uh, uh, the the number of people killed and uh, injured uh um, in in the uh, kaling war etc have sought to be uh, understood uh, with reference to the uh, policy of janpad nivesh also uh, this is uh, not a decisive uh, kind of an account nevertheless uh, uh, one interpretation or one kind of analysis can be made uh, with reference to uh, such policies of the kaling war also uh then uh, the uh, there are also uh, northern black polished wares uh, which are deluxe wares uh, uh, whose gloss uh, is is uh, qualitatively uh, superior uh, as compared to painted grey ware and so forth uh, these northern black polished wares start making their appearance beyond the vindhyas uh, uh, by around the time we come to the uh, modern period and that also testifies to the uh, advancing frontiers of the material culture uh, exemplifying the north indian life uh, and uh, they 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 uh, kind of uh, uh, inform us about the material conditions 
uh, also uh, in the in the areas south of the Vindhyas. Uh, alongside, we have uh, the Panchmark coins, which we already discussed uh, uh, with reference to the uh, issuing agency, which probably up to the uh, modern period was not the state, but the trading guilds and so forth. So. Uh, this uh, conceptualization of uh, the modern economy or um, modern empire being an extremely centralized kind of an empire uh, and bureaucratized kind of an empire uh, has uh, some, some problems and uh, that is something that we will be talking about uh, maybe tomorrow uh, because uh, that calls for an extensive survey of the nature of the state, the administrative structure and so forth. But uh, uh, the way we can conclude uh, today's discussion is that uh, we are encountered with uh, the richness of sources, be it literary or archaeological, uh, be it uh, uh, local accounts or uh, accounts left by the foreigners uh, about the modern period. Uh, and uh, that is how our understanding of the modern period is somewhat qualitatively different and superior to the uh, prior uh, uh, periods in history and uh, it should also be seen in continuation to the historical processes which were triggered around the middle of the first millennium BC, around 6th century BC, uh, around the time the territorial states emerged in North India and it is the climax of uh, the emergence of territorial states and emergence of monarchical form of polity as the uh, as the uh, you can say uh, most uh, superior uh, kind of uh, polity, most dominant kind of polity uh, in the form of the Mauryas. So uh, the emergence of the Mauryans have to be understood in uh, in, the, in the context of its lineage from uh, the emergence of the territorial states around the uh, beginning, uh, around the 6th uh, century BC in North India. Um, and uh, that is how I think uh, it, it needs to be understood with reference to historical processes. Okay. How uh, there are some uh, reliability factor also about the historical factors. So how do one check the historical facts and reliability? Because when uh, when we confront with the archaeological sources, other literary sources, sometimes the conflicting uh, facts uh, emerge out. So, how to uh, get uh, from this riddle? That is a very good question. In fact, uh, nice that you asked this. And uh, uh, during the course of our, of our discussion, we did refer to the possibility, uh, the fortunate possibility of uh, corroborating the uh, evidence that comes from one particular source. This is something that we could not have done for the period prior to the Mauryan period. But for the Mauryan period, since sources are multiple uh, and they also come from different traditions, if it is literary sources, they are coming not only from uh, conventional Brahmanical uh, tradition, but they are also coming from heterodox traditions of Buddhism, Jainism, Ajivikas and so forth. Similarly, uh, foreign accounts are also present. So, uh, one can always uh, correlate and check the credibility of a particular information given in one particular source, uh, cross check uh, this with uh, the uh, its, its, po its possibility uh, with reference to archaeological sources. For example, if a modern state is, uh, is uh, presented as a materially very, uh, very uh, advanced kind of an state and uh, the political organization is very sophisticated, the material lifestyle is uh, very superior and that kind of projection is made in literary sources, then that can be cross-checked with the available uh, archaeological sources. Northern black polished ware, profusion of northern black polished ware which stands for the material prosperity, its distribution and so forth. Uh, the coins uh, uh, informing us about exchange, level of exchange, degree of exchange, also uh, the transactions and uh, denominations of the transactions if it is a, a high value coin and so forth. So these can be cross verified. Uh, and in the uh, modern period, this can be done better on account of multiplicity of sources, okay. which unfortunately was not the case uh, with the period prior to this. Okay. So, well, friends, with this moment, we conclude the lecture and I thank all of you for watching. And on behalf, I thank Dr. Sankar Kumar for giving such an insightful lecture. Thank you very much.